Hello everyone, I'm MVL and as you may already know the Xbox 360 online marketplace is closing soon. So I thought it'd be a good time to take a look at some digital only games to get your hands on before they're gone. So without any further ado, let's get started. First up we have Batman Arkham Origins Blackgate Deluxe. This is an action game and in a similar vein to another great game that you should also grab whilst you can, Alan Wake's American Nightmare which is digital only on the Xbox 360 but does have a physical copy, albeit on the PC. Batman Arkham Origins Blackgate does have physical versions on both the Nintendo DS and PlayStation Vita. However, the Xbox 360 digital only deluxe version of this game features unique improvements to the graphics and gameplay. The enhanced presentation makes the game look better on the big screen and the altered controls make the game work well enough on a regular controller. I honestly feel like this game gets lost in the shuffle of the Arkham game series and even some fans of those games don't know or just don't talk about this game, which is a shame because this is a great game. Although this game differs from the other games in the series as it utilises a 2.5D perspective, the beat-em-up and investigatory action and antics of the game series are still presented well. And I'd say this game is a must-play for fans of the series. That's Batman Arkham Origins Blackgate Deluxe. Next up we have Blade Kitten. This is an action platformer which uses a 2.5D perspective and plays out episodically. The game is based off a webcomic about a half-human, half-cat bounty hunter by the name of Kit Ballard, and I think this game is a total hidden gem. You don't need to know anything about the webcomic to get into this game since the story is set three years before the comic. Kit Ballard ventures to an alien planetoid called Hollow Wish, tracking down a local troublemaker called Terra Lee, where Kit immediately draws the ire of rival bounty hunter Justice Creel, and the two of them get down to it and come to blows rather quickly. As Kit sets out chasing justice, the game puts the player through some challenging platforming and hack and slash action. Kit can use her floating sword, the dark blade, in a variety of creative ways to help you through the levels, such as hurling it through barricades to throw switches or pressing it into a surface to hold on. Kit also gains an animal sidekick Skiffy that can claim objects out of reach, and Kit can also ride dinosaur-like mounts called newts for fast-paced action. The game also has a lot of alternate costumes to unlock along the way as you collect treasure throughout the levels. Overall this game is colourful, fast and fun and I think really deserving of more attention. If you like what you see with this hidden gem, get your hands on it whilst you can. That's Blade Kitten. Next up we have Castle of Illusion starring Mickey Mouse. This is a platformer and an enhanced 3D remake of the Sega Mega Drive game of the same name where the player takes on the role of Mickey Mouse on a mission to rescue Minnie Mouse from the clutches of an evil witch. The original game was an absolute classic 16-bit platformer, and with that in mind the expectation is lofty for this remake, but I have to say that this remake delivers. The gameplay is timeless, and the stage design and challenge are great. The majority of the action takes place in a 2.5D perspective, though there are some sections and challenges that are fully 3D. There's also a Super Mario 64 style castle area between levels where new levels can be unlocked and previous stages can be replayed. Mickey can jump to reach new areas and avoid hazards and this jump can also spring off some objects and leap off some enemies as you destroy them by hopping on them. You can also throw a limited number of projectiles you find during a level which can clear obstacles and open chests for rewards. There's plenty of loot to be collected during each level and you want to grab everything you can, as if you want to save Minnie Mouse, you'll need to use the resources you find to unlock the later levels and proceed further in the game. That's Castle of Illusion, starring Mickey Mouse. Next up we have Double Dragon 2, Wonder of the Dragons. This is a beat-em-up game, and it's a 3D remake based off the arcade and Nintendo versions of Double Dragon 2, The Revenge. You take on the role of Billy or Jimmy out for revenge against a rival villainous organisation who took out Billy's partner, Marion. You actually get to play as Marion in the tutorial dojo before she's gunned down, as you learn the basics of the game. You learn to attack, defend, and how to use special moves. 
One contentious and highly criticised aspect of the game is that although the special powers are vaguely hinted at being bad during the tutorial, it will be unbeknown to the player that if you use special moves at all during the entire playthrough, even when prompted to learn them during the opening tutorial, you will receive the bad ending of the game. That aspect does feel like a trap that everyone would surely fall into, but I guess there's replayability in an effort to attempt to receive a good ending, but not using special moves will make the game a lot harder. Regardless, this game has a lot to live up to compared to the original classic games that it is based off. That's Double Dragon 2, Wonder of the Dragons. Next up we have Duke Nukem, The Manhattan Project. This is an action platformer. Whilst I think that most people will think of Duke Nukem from the height of its popularity during the time of Duke Nukem 3D, I do really appreciate that this game takes the series back to its 2D style side-scrolling origins. This game plays in a 2.5D perspective and sees the titular Duke Nukem blasting bad guys across platforms and saving babes from captivity. Duke has a variety of weapons he can find to blow bad guys away, and Duke can also use power-ups and gadgets like a jetpack to get around levels easier. Some areas are locked, requiring keycards, and some places and collectibles can be hidden behind obstacles like exploding barrels, and these issues need to be dealt with to move on. Each episode also contains a captured babe who must be rescued in order to proceed as well. There's some great run and gun action to enjoy in this game, and some puzzle solving as you move back and forth through the levels, finding your way to the end. This game really is a nice return to form for Duke Nukem, and I think it's really worth a play, especially if you're a big fan of the Duke Nukem series and the original side-scrolling games in the series. So if you want to kick ass and chew bubblegum, and you're all out of gum, then give this game a go. It's a real blast. That's Duke Nukem, The Manhattan Project. Next up we have Girl Fight. This is a fighting game, and this game is marketed to be a bit naughty, but don't get too excited, as aside from some slightly adult-aimed artwork gained upon completion or unlocked with points accumulated through playing, which I won't be showing, you won't see anything too rude in this game, and I think the vibe is similar to the presentation of some of the Dead or Alive series game characters. Girl Fight is a game with an all-ladies roster of 8 fighters. You start the game with one character and unlock more as you go. You get points as you fight which lets you unlock things like costumes, colour palette swaps, artwork and new special powers to use during battles. Girl Fight is pretty light on story with only a little dialogue from the end boss Chrome between battles. So my interpretation is that Chrome has captured and digitised powerful combatants from different places and set them against each other to find a powerful foe to battle. Once you defeat Chrome and her flaming final form thereafter, she releases you. Girl Fight is also pretty light on variety with the characters, combos and manoeuvres, so I found myself using the same attacks repeatedly, but I did like using the block and counter moves. Despite the lack of depth, Girl Fight is cheap and a fun pick up and play affair. If you like what you see, you should check it out. That's Girl Fight. Next up we have Hard Corpse Uprising. This is a run and gun game and this game is part of the Contra game series. It's actually a prequel to both the original Contra and Contra Hard Corps as well. The main game modes include an arcade mode and a rising mode. The rising mode plays out the same as arcade mode except that you are able to power up between stages, which makes the game easier. So in that regard, I kind of think of both modes as just different difficulties, and to be fair, as a Contra game, this game is already pretty hard. You initially have two characters to choose from, Bahamut and the character you are seeing right now, Crystal. You can also purchase separate DLC and download the following extra characters, Harley, Leviathan, Sayuri and Tiberius, and they have different abilities as well. Your character can double jump around and dash to avoid oncoming attacks, and you can also collect various weapon upgrades through the stages, like spread shot and other weapons that aren't spread shot. I should probably just always use spread shot because it's the best. Anyway, this is a faithful, fun and challenging Contra game, even though it doesn't bear the Contra name. 
Check it out. That's Hard Corpse Uprising. Next up we have Hydrophobia, and this is an action-adventure game that I think is a real hidden gem. The story follows Kate Wilson, a systems engineer aboard a gigantic city-sized luxury ocean vessel called the Queen of the World. As the voyage is thrown into troubled waters as bad guys attack, Kate can use gadgets to find clues and take over machinery like security cameras to view ahead. Kate can also find passcodes which are important to bypass barriers to move on. Kate can climb and swim effectively as she battles the obstacles between herself and survival. Weapons can also be used as the ship's attackers come for any survivors directly. As the world around Kate begins to flood, she has to face her fears and battle her past trauma to save the future. I think this game looks great, and the water effects are tremendous. This game actually uses its own hydro engine technology, which provides realistic fluid dynamics, as the water can flow freely and interact with its surroundings. I think that the game looks really impressive, and plays really well as well. Unfortunately this game was planned for three episodes, but only this one actually materialised, so the story does end on a cliffhanger. Regardless, I had a lot of fun with this. It was definitely wetter, I mean better, than I anticipated, and I think you should give it a flow. I mean go, if you like water you see. That was Hydrophobia. Next up we have Strider. This is a platforming hack and slash game, and is a 2.5 reboot of the Strider game series. To me, this game also feels somewhat metroidvania in the sense that you can freely explore and backtrack each stage. You can find hidden power-ups that do stuff like permanently increase your character's health, and you can also locate new powers that help you proceed through the game. On top of the regular attacks, jumping, and being able to cling to most surfaces to traverse, you can also unlock abilities like a slide move that lets you enter small spaces, a strong strike that can activate items like door switches and break shields, and a downward thrust whilst leaping that also lets you break through grounded barriers. This game looks fantastic and it plays great. My only tiny complaint is that sometimes dialogue can appear on screen and it takes up some of the lower portion of the screen, which mostly is where the majority of the action takes place, so your view can be obscured. But this is a great game, and a worthy entry into the Great Strider series. The action is fast paced and fun, and although this game differs from the original Strider, if you like that game, or this kind of game in general, I don't think you can possibly go wrong with this. I think it's really good. That's Strider. And finally we have Unbound Saga. This is a beat-em-up game, where self-aware comic book character Rick Ajax meets a mysterious stranger, Laurie Machete, in a fourth wall breaking adventure. The theme of the game kind of reminds me of Comic Zone from the Mega Drive, where the action takes place inside of comic book panels. In this game, the presentation is very meta, with the maker drawing in oncoming enemies in new panels as you proceed. The player has access to two characters at all times, and each character has different abilities and powers on top of regular attacks and defences. Rick can pick up enemies and objects and hurl them around, and into other enemies, whereas Laurie is more nimble and can leap around with ease. Each character can also gain new skills as you progress through the game, and you can collect tokens during the game to use to upgrade your character's skills. You can also find power-ups and health restoration during play as well. I found this game very interesting and I enjoyed the experience of essentially playing through a Dark Horse comic with a twist. I think this game is really very cool, so I recommend checking it out. That's Unbound Saga. And there you have it, that was 10 online only games on the Xbox 360. And the thing is, there are countless other digital only games from the Xbox 360 marketplace I haven't been able to cover. Maybe some more hidden gems, or some of your own personal favourites which may be lost to time when the marketplace closes soon. Let me know in the comments. And if you like the video, be sure to leave a like or a comment to let me know what you think. And don't forget to subscribe for more awesome content. And if you'd like to, you can also support me through Patreon or YouTube channel membership. Thank you for watching, I've been MVL, and I will catch you next time.